Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stand the Energy Man here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters, and we're trying to make a big difference here in Hawaii. And today we have a, a great show where we're pressing our technical abilities here by Skyping in from the Big Island with uh, Paul Pontio from Blue Planet and Mr. Um, Dr. Kareem Zaib uh, from Hydro-Quebec. So we've got the uh, U.S.-Canadian um, coalition going on in the Big Island to talk about some energy issues. And uh, we're going to Skype them in and try and get uh, some insight not only on uh, clean energy and, and hydrogen, but also on some battery technologies. So uh, welcome, Paul and uh, Kareem. Good, good to have you on the show here. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Good to be back. Hey, first off, let's, um, let's let uh, Kareem tell us a little bit about himself and also about um, the kind of work that Hydro-Quebec does uh, in energy so that we can get some perspective on, on uh, where his background is. Uh, Karim Zagib, uh, I am general director of uh, Papa Pixima, energy storage and uh, transportation education. And uh, I work for Hydro Quebec about 23 years. And Hydro Quebec is a utility uh, 100 percent owned by the government of Quebec. And we're producing about 90 90 percent of our power coming from Hydro. It's a clean and uh, green energy. And Hydro Quebec is only one utility in North America that they own the research and they invest around 130 million in research and development. And uh, the center of uh, the Institute of Research and Development and Innovation was in seven. Terrific. So um, when, when you're talking hydro, because here in Hawaii we don't have uh, big uh, reservoirs and, and dams and things, um, you're talking hydroelectric, like from uh, fast-moving rivers and and through dams, correct? Yes. Yeah. So Hydro Quebec is divided in four departments. First department is equipment housing. They make the dams and the generally production of electricity by water by hydro. And the third uh, division is transportation. We are using the one the highest voltage, about 730 kV, and distributions. So distribution we have around four million clients. And we also export our green energy to our Canadian neighbors, like Ontario and New Brunswick, and also USA, uh, state, like our neighbors in New York State and other neighbors uh, behind us. Great. So you actually are producing green power uh, using hydroelectric, and you produce enough to not only take care of your own customers, but also to export to New York and uh, some of your neighbors to the south, correct? Yes. Great. And what brings you to Hawaii and to visit Paul Pontio on the Big Island? Is there anything you can share with us on that? Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, I have a collaboration for for over 25 years with the Borean from the University of Hawaii. We are developing uh, battery materials, safe battery materials, and the Department of Energy U.S. And we are uh, working for what you call it uh, uh, battery for advanced transportation, mainly uh, by launch, Battery Lab, Hawaii, and also Department of Energy, was developing what you call it safe uh, battery, safe material like uh, lithium ion battery, like uh, ion phosphate. And we are coming here to see Paul in order to have some collaboration. And we try to introduce this technology that we licensed many years safe technology for energy storage and also long cycle life. And also, 90 90% of our technology is recycled. So, we can use this material for recycling our technology. That's really important. I think a lot of people leave that out of the calculation when they uh, start talking, especially lithium battery technology. They forget about the, the fact that, you know, lithium is a fairly rare metal in terms of uh, availability on the planet. And uh, recycling, it's critically important if you plan to use lithium in batteries. Isn't that uh, pretty accurate? So uh, I think the vision of Hydro Quebec, I have a program in my uh, center of excellence that we are doing research. Even we have a student that they are doing the master and PhD with University of McGill. For us, recycling is very important that our our earth and our humanity might clean and not just after 
finishing this uh, battery and replace them anywhere for any place. And because battery, we have some electrolytes, we have some side reactions without. So for us, recycling is very important, and we are pushing to recycle. As I said, our materials and our battery is 90-90% recycled. Great. Yeah, I, I know we didn't have a chance to talk about this before, but um, I saw an article earlier this week that talked about mining lithium from ocean water um, as part of a water purification um, process in countries that desalinate their water, where they could also harvest the lithium. And I know that the oceans contain some lithium, but it's, it's like trace amounts, but they figure with the scale of the oceans, um, you could probably recover some. Is, is Canada, do you know if... If Canada or any of your institutions are looking at um, that concept for um, harvesting lithium from the oceans? Uh, I don't think so in Canada, but uh, there was some program in New Zealand about 10 years and 15 years for this, uh, for this uh, kind of uh, taking uh, uh, the lithium for oceans, but not in our side. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I could add. add. I think something important for the viewers to understand is the distinction in lithium batteries and lithium chemistries. Um, one of the reasons we chose to use lithium ferrous phosphate was for the safety reasons, but also the recyclability of it. Cobalt is what is in most of the <clears throat> lithium batteries that are in use in the world today, and cobalt is, is not a very environmentally friendly element. So you can't just throw that into a landfill. Uh, you can't recycle it as easily. Um, so it's really important to, to know that there's a distinction in chemistries, but that the lithium ferrous phosphate is almost 100% recyclable, you know, 99 point something. So that's, that's a big difference uh, in being able to reclaim all the materials and metals that are used in the process. And, and also, I know that um, the lithium iron phosphate technology is also much more stable. Um, is that uh, also one of the big uh, comparative factors compared to lithium cobalt? I believe uh, lithium iron phosphate, they have the longest cycle life. Now, if you still about lithium cobalt, let's see, maybe 1,000 cycle, but the iron phosphate versus graphite has negative return. We spoke about 15,000 cycles to 20,000 cycles. So, and we cycle them 100% deep and uh, charge them 100%. It's not like 2% of charging. So we fully decharge them and fully charge them in the, at least 15,000 cycles. So we can see that the calendar life of this technology is over 20 years. Yeah, that's really important. A lot yeah. of people, um, they, they think of batteries uh, in a fairly limited scope, and their experience with batteries is either the kind they put in their flashlight or their computer or their car. And um, you're, you're right. When it comes to designing the battery properly, um, if you're not able to discharge it completely and recharge it, um, you're really missing out on a, a real capability. And that's that's one of the real strengths of the uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries, as I understand it. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, again, going back to the end of life scenario with a battery, well, one becomes uh, a matter of recycling and the other one becomes a hazmat disposal issue. So those are, those are things that a lot of people don't take into account. You know, with flashlight batteries, most people throw them in the, in the trash, which is not a good thing to do, but that's what they do. With large-scale energy storage batteries, it becomes a much bigger problem environmentally, and just the monetary cost of disposal uh, is a big deal. So if you've got a battery chemistry that outlasts one other chemistry by 40%, that means you're going to get much more of your investment return out of that product. So how mature, Paul and, and Kareem, is, the, is that lithium iron uh, technology um, in terms of uh, ready for market? I know you, you, you work with Sony and I believe Panasonic also does uh, that technology. Is it mature and ready? And, and while you're at it, uh, address the safety issues with that too. I know that's another thing that people don't think about with batteries. but Nowadays, you can't get on airplanes with certain lithium battery devices and, and products uh, because of the fire hazard. 
Um, so can you can you talk a little bit to the safety issues? I think uh, the technology is mature, is already in the market. And uh, our partner Sony now Morata, they are making very great batteries. And, uh, and uh, this technology also is used mainly in China for uh, electric buses and also for electric vehicles and for energy storage also is known as a very safe technology. And for our experience in Hydro Quebec, we have already put about two years, 1.2 megawatt, 1.2 megawatt hours, one thing in our research institute. And uh, we deliver to Hydro Quebec uh, distribution about, uh, I think last uh, December, 2.4 megawatt, 2.4 megawatt hours, and is already on distribution site of Hydro Quebec. Wow. Yeah, and we, we've been actually testing ours for going on four years now. But it's important to note that Sony started manufacturing the lithium ferrous phosphate batteries back in 2008. So this is not a new technology, so to speak, or a new startup technology. This is pretty mature and well documented. Can I talk a little bit about the nail test that you've seen um, on, on that technology compared to standard lithium cobalt? Yeah, we actually, we have videos um, of what they call the nail test. And they literally take a lithium cell, uh, the LFP, lithium ferrous phosphate, and an NCM nickel cobalt manganese cell, and they actually drive a nail completely through them to see what, what to simulate the dis, uh, damage to a cell. Uh, with the LFP, basically there's a temperature change, uh, temperature starts rising. There's a, a patented valving system that opens up and lets out the pressure, as well as an internal fuse. And a little bit of organic solvent rips out, and, and that's pretty much it. On cobalt side, and you can see this on thousands of YouTube videos, guys destroying cobalt lithium batteries, they explode violently as soon as the, the product was breached or shorted. They release all of their energy very, very quickly. And, and that's a safety hazard. It's uh, easy to explain. This is what we call it, the triangle of fires. You have the oxygen. You have the gasoline, and then you have the internal short circuit like much. Because oxygen is bending in phosphate, so it means that you have not oxygen really. But in the cobalt oxide, at high voltage and so on, and you have, if there any internal short circuit, you have internal short circuit that make a heat, and you have the gasoline, which is electrolyte, and oxygen evolution coming from cathode, and then you're going to make fire. So it's, it's basic simulation. So it's 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 pretty much a um, uh, a um, what do they call it spontaneous combustion once the oxygen is exposed to the lithium cobalt uh, chemistry. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, we're all kind of used to the the lithium technology in in cell phones and computers, um, uh, but when you take it to scale, uh, and I don't want to. Pimp um, or, or, or get on Elon Musk's bad side because I know that uh, Paul, your boss, drives some of his cars. But uh, you know that technology um, carries a lot of those batteries, and that seems to be kind of a, a dangerous mode to get into in the transportation sector, where you have a lot of those lithium cobalt batteries basically lined up under your car, and if they're not armor plated, any kind of metal. Uh, that cuts through the batteries, does that oxygen exposure that Kareem talked about, and gives you a pretty robust fire. Um, what, what, I mean, from my experience, that means the car is pretty much totaled as soon as the fire starts, because it, it doesn't get put out very quickly. Yeah, they've had several Tesla fires that have been caught on camera, uh, either through security cameras or from first responders. And I think one of the, the notable ones was uh, a Tesla was following a truck ahead of him, and a piece of steel fell off of the truck. And it actually punctured the bottom of the battery case on the car and penetrated and caught those batteries on fire. Now, to Tesla's credit, they had caught, they compartmentalized their batteries so that it contained the fire in that section allowing the driver enough time to pull over and exit the vehicle and get out. But I think there was also a fire in Norway um, two years ago, 
where at a charging station, the car caught on fire and, and it became a fireworks display and melted the car down to the tires, to yeah. the ground. And this isn't a poo-poo Tesla or their, their, their product because, you know, they have a beautifully designed car and it gets great, um, you know, great range out of the battery system. It's, it, it looks good. It handles well. It's uh, got a great reputation. But it's just talking about the technology and uh, you just have to be aware of these things. You know, if you do see something happening where you, you may be puncturing your batteries under a car like that uh, for just for your own um, safety. You need to know that you can't spend time collecting up all your belongings and taking your time getting out of the car because uh, it's a serious uh, safety issue. Yeah, and it's one thing to have a fire, a fire in a vehicle that you can get out of quickly, and another to have it inside of a building where you may not have the, the, the time, the luxury of time to exit up. That, that's true when you start to scale this technology up. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back in 60 seconds to spend some more time with Kareem and, and Paul and uh, talk some more about some energy. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man, here with Paul Pontio and Kareem, Dr. Kareem Zagib from Hydro Quebec. He's their transportation guru, just like I'm the hydrogen guru here in Honolulu. Um, but he's a lot more educated than I am, with a lot more experience than I have, and a lot smarter than I am. Not to mention good looking. Um, so he's he's got me beat on all on all cases. But we've been talking a lot about batteries and uh, and the technology that's out there and. And both of them have worked extensively in the energy field. And um, we're talking a little bit about the, um, the pluses and minuses of the different lithium uh, technologies that are out there. And there's some really good ones out there now that, um, that they're exposed to. But one of the things, Paul, I've noticed is that um, the lithium uh, iron or the lithium um, ferrous is um, not so much used in transportation. Is, is that something on the horizon or? Well, I'll let Kareem answer that one, because the argument that I've always uh, received on that front is the penalty of weight. Uh, it's a slightly heavier chemistry and a technology. Um, for stationary storage, none of that matters, but I'll, I'll let Kareem kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, so uh, the iron phosphate, as I said, has safety, they have a calendar life, they have all advanced, except the energy density is lower compared to lithium cobalt oxide and other technology by volume and by weight, both of them. And in order to have range, big range and so on, maybe is not the right technology that using iron phosphate for huge range and so on. But now I believe all worldwide and uh, what uh, us also and other car companies, battery companies, they are working on solid state batteries. And so you say, but you can increase the range cell and then safety because the electrolyte is no flammable. All the lithium ion today, ion phosphate or lithium cobalt or any technology of the lithium ion today, the electrolyte, because in the battery you have anode and cathode, and in between them is electrolyte with ionic conductors and is flammable. So now the direction is to increase the energy density and also to make it more safe and also low cost. Around now today, I think the cost of lithium battery in the past is around 250. And in order that the gathering car or internal combustion engine will be disappeared, that the part of the battery must be $100 as kilowatt hour. And they believe in five years, we are able to reach this kind of the cost of the lithium ion. 
But anyway, the lithium ion or others, the energy density also, it become a limit. So why we need another technology in future, like hydrogen, maybe for we will explain and so on. And I believe also that hydrogen is, has a lot of energy and the battery has the power. And we need the both of this technology for transportation and energy storage and so on. And uh, then Paul will explain more on that. Yeah, so what Karim was just alluding to is, is why we see in fuel cell EVs, there's always a battery as well as the fuel cell. I think a lot of people have the misconception that fuel cell cars are running purely on hydrogen fuel cells. Um, if you separate out the power and the energy, then that's what you really need to perform to the standards that we want a vehicle and transportation to actually do. Uh, having the fuel cell there for the long duration of the energy and having the battery to supply that instantaneous power for acceleration and things like that, that's a perfect marriage. It, it also is one of the reasons why at, at our energy lab and our microgrid here, we marry hydrogen and batteries together because we feel that this is actually the perfect combination of technologies to support microgrids and energy storage. With the battery, you have the quick response, you have the instantaneous power that can absorb huge startup loads of motors and equipment. And the hydrogen can provide the backup power and it can provide the long duration energy side. So when you tie the two together, it's a great combination, especially if you're in an off-grid type of microgrid situation where you have excess energy at times. And this is one of the issues we have in the state, as you know, Stan. We have solar farms and wind turbine farms that are sitting idle sometimes because there's not enough demand on the grid for them to actually export their power. So we take that excess energy and we turn it into hydrogen and we save it for when we need it. Uh, I don't want to get too long-winded on this, but the, the other thing about hydrogen is when you start looking at the cost of energy storage, you're looking at the cost per kilowatt hour stored over the life of the technology. Batteries are always going to be a little more expensive than hydrogen storage because they perform a different service, so to speak. If you take and you build your system with the batteries you need for the round trip efficiency and the quick response where you're cycling those electrons very rapidly, at least once a day, then hydrogen becomes more economical for storing electrons over a long period for backup fuel or backup power. Um, so, so there's a combination, you know, and a certain ratio of combining these two net technologies that actually makes the most sense. Too often in our, in our industries, we hear arguments on both sides that, well, hydrogen is better or batteries are better, and, and it's just not true. The, neither one is better or worse than the other. They're just different. So combining the two makes the most sense. Yeah, it sounds like in a world uh, that's focused on diversity, we ought to be applying the same principles to batteries and hydrogen. It's, it's just a different kind of way to get your energy. And, uh, and we shouldn't discriminate between batteries and hydrogen. We should be looking at them as a, the perfect pairing to make the, the best product. In fact, I know you guys visited my shop yesterday with, um, with uh, Guillaume uh, AA, and uh, we talked about battery-dominant vehicles versus fuel cell-dominant vehicles, and there's advantages to having them set up one way or another. So you actually can custom build your vehicle to take advantage of the battery uh, when you need more of a battery uh, performance or fuel cell when you need more of a fuel cell performance. And the, the good designers and the good engineers are gonna come up with that perfect marriage of the two technologies. And, and I think that's why a lot of folks um, across the, the industry are really being bullish on uh, hydrogen right now because they see that it is a good match. Um, the, the battery and hydrogen uh, um, partnership uh, makes for a perfect transportation solution. So, hey, um, while we got Kareem on, on today too, 
he's got a, a pretty good picture on the international scene of where hydrogen's going. Um, could you give us some insight from your perspective, Kareem, about you know what's going on in Europe or Asia um, on the hydrogen scene and, and whether you're feeling optimistic in 2018, 2019? Well, so what I saw for me, I think uh, there, there, there are many advanced countries that uh, building hydrogen as very important energy. So, for example, Japan, this is public information that by 2020, Japan, they're going to introduce hydrogen for Olympic Games. They are, they are very, very aggressive, very doing very well. And then they believe there will be opportunity in 2020 to see hydrogen in the buses and the cars around the, the athletes and the Olympic Games and so on. And they believe this is maybe will be accelerate uh, the penetration of uh, hydrogen uh, by the Games, Olympic Games 2020. And I think there was also a very important company like Kawasaki, this public information, Kawasaki, Shuda, and others working. Toyota, Honda, they are promoting hydrogen. And was also, it didn't have to be in internet, there was a huge consortium between uh, Air Liquids, Total, BMW, Toyota, GM, and others. They want to promote hydrogen, I think Mercedes-Benz and others. And also, Department of Energy U.S., because I am part of, uh, of a BATT program, and they go to review meetings once a year, and they have a huge program on hydrogen that all national labs that working on hydrogen can be for transportation or for production and so on. And they believe also China, they want to go to this hydrogen, and because, you know, hydrogen, if you see, the image density of hydrogen is 30,000 watt hour by kilograms. It's a huge compared to the gasoline is around 11 watt, 11,000 watt hour by kilogram. And this is now the efficiency of the internal combustion engine is only 27% what you need about. And the best of the batteries, you can see maybe 500, 600 watt hour by kilograms compared to 30,000. Why these countries, why these companies are very interesting on, on uh, the hydrogen uh, applications can be for production of, of electricity, also transportation, or others also uh, applications. Yeah, I think that that's one of the, the, the real interesting things about the time period we're in right now. Uh, this is kind of one of the first times in history where we can start to tackle transportation and our, our stationary energy needs with basically the same technology. So it's, it's really encouraging to see this happening. Yeah, I agree, and uh, and and I think the when I look uh, internationally, uh, we're at that right time. And things are just going to start happening. I know China's moving forward in hydrogen. Um, South Korea, Japan, and Europe. Uh, Denmark's got one island that's already completely covered with hydrogen uh, fueling stations and transportation. And uh, we need to keep pressing forward with that. And I, I think uh, if if all of us uh, on this show and and throughout the community keep uh, educating folks, because I know that in, in many cases, even rather astute, educated, sophisticated individuals have some really bad misperceptions about hydrogen. And if we could kind of kind of get those things uh, pushed to the side and replaced with real facts, um, hydrogen would start becoming much more acceptable to the general population. Well, you know, it's we believe it or not, we've already hit our uh, our end game here at uh, Think Tech for our show, and uh, I'd like to thank you, especially Kareem and Guillaume in the background there for for being on the show and uh, helping coach us along. And um, we'll hope you back in Hawaii soon, and uh, we'll get to visit some more and get another update from you and Paul on the hydrogen uh, around the world. So thank you for being on the show, and um, until next weekend, we'll uh, we'll be talking to you next week Friday on Stan Energy Man. Aloha. Oh, wow.